Hi all, here we are in chapter six, and this lecture will cover the principles of interviewing. So making sure that you've read the chapter and then kind of corresponding what we learn in lecture as well before we're taking the quiz. I think our text has some really, really great examples and questions to go over, um, great supplemental material to help here with principles of interviewing. And I think this chapter is really one of the most user-friendly and utilitarian going forward into um, the job market and our search for our big boy and big girl jobs. So uh, really, really focusing in on this chapter and how it will be beneficial for us, specifically in this class with some upcoming assignments and then outside um, in the real world here. So first of all, we'll start with the definition of interview. So an interview is a two-party interaction in which at least one party has specific has a specific serious purpose, and that usually involves the asking and answering of questions. So don't be confused here with two-party. That doesn't necessarily mean two people. So for instance, you might be being interviewed by a group of people, such as a panel, or maybe two or three people, um, and they are one party and you are the other. So a two-party interview interaction and there's a specific and serious purpose to why you are meeting um, and usually the asking and answering of questions kind of takes the cake, takes the precedence there in interviews. So interview characteristics here. It's important to know that interviewing is a lot different than communication. And one of those reasons is because interviews are very planned. And we'll talk about how we need to plan for interviews, both as the interviewee and as the interviewer in this lecture. So interviews are very planned. Conversation is typically very spontaneous. Um, interviewing is very purposeful, so we talked about in our definition there is a rhyme or reason for um, the question and answer, right? They have a very specific purpose in mind. Control, so here one of the parties that we talked about is really in control of the interview. So we'll talk about amounts of speaking and that doesn't necessarily mean who is in control. So for instance, in the public speaking setting, the speaker is typically the one that's really in control and the audience members are the listeners, right? In an interview, the person that is doing the interview, the interviewer, will speak less because they're really interested in hearing the responses of the interviewee. So here, this, the presenter or the interviewer is at 30% speaking um, within that time because they're largely listening to the interviewee's responses. But the interviewer is really in control of the interview and kind of sets the tone um, of how the interaction is going to go, and we'll talk about that further. Again, here interviews have two purpose, two parties, and the amount of speaking, as we said, 30% interviewer, 70% interviewee. And there are various types of interviews. I think typically what we think of um, right away is an employment interview, but there's lots of different types, and we'll go over those in our lecture as well. But first of all, let's start with planning the interview. So in planning the interview, it's really essential that we define the goal of the interview. So what do we want to get out of our correspondence? In defining our goal, guys, it's really important to be as descriptive and specific as possible uh, with our goal. So for instance, I work as a newspaper reporter as well, and I often really have to think about defining my goal and what my objective of my story is really going to be. What's the hook? What What's really important out of a larger story or a lot of information? So for example, uh, my town recently went under um, a huge construction project that kind of took over the whole town and I was in charge of uh, reporting on the project. Well, there's like five different construction companies. There's YDOT um, in charge of everything. There's a spokesperson, communications person that lives out of town. There's engineers in town. So I really have to figure out what is my goal for this specific story? Is it a holistic overview of the project? Is it one specific street or area in the project? Is it how that's going to influence businesses? Is that going to be the main emphasis? Is it one person and what their job is within the project. So we always have to make sure that we have our goal defined as we go into planning the interview. And that needs to be one of the first steps that we're doing, really defining and honing in on what we are wanting to find out in our interaction. 
then we need to identify and analyze the other party. And um, Here it's important to think about knowledge level, others' concept of self, your image, and attitudes about the topic. So for instance, knowledge level might really come into play if I'm trying to talk to someone about specifics in regards to um, why certain things are being done in this road construction, renovation that the town is undergoing, then I might need to talk to the engineer. If I'm looking for more of a holistic approach on how the construction is going to benefit the community in the long run, but might be sort of a hindrance to businesses and the public in the meantime, then I might need to talk to the communication spokesperson, for example. I might also need to interview some business owners to get that first person um, knowledge and story, right? So I have to know the knowledge level there, knowledge level in terms of employment interviews, and again guys, we'll get to the different types of interviews, might be do they have the educational background or experience to support even doing this interview. So you have to go through kind of a synthesizing and planning um, experience before you even get to that interview stage, right? Also, in planning for these interviews, we need to think of others' concept of self. And here, broadly, this kind of means, um, is the person that you are thinking of interviewing um, comfortable in talking about the situations? They have enough background and experience to be able to explain fully. Are they willing? Is their attitude favorable? So these kind of tie together. Is their attitude favorable towards the project, favorable to maybe my newspaper and talking to me specifically, my image, my image within the community as a trustworthy reporter? Those kinds of things that I'm tying into my construction example there. So again, planning is really a detailed process and has more steps than we would initially think. So continuing here, we need to prepare a list of topics that we want to discuss or kind of a list of questions, uh, which we'll get to here. But first of all, Broad topics, what are we really going for in the interview? So going back to what did we define as our goal, what topics fit into that goal, and then we'll break it out into the possible questions to address those topics. In preparing a list of topics, we need to think about the best interview structure. So do we want a very highly structured interview where you're getting um, basic responses from a lot of different people. So for instance, if you are doing a demographic interview where you're just doing like a survey type of type of method there, are you doing a unstructured interview where you just have some topics in mind and you're just going to go feel out the topic and see what comes out? So for instance, maybe I have an idea for a story but I'm not really sure uh, what the hook is going to be. So I just go and visit with someone that's in the field um, and kind of figure out where the story might be, what niche might be cool to write and discuss about, right? Then there's a moderately structured interview, and guys, I think this is the one that's used most often. So a moderately structured interview, you have a general idea of the topics you want to cover, you have a goal in mind, and you also have several questions where you're willing to pose the question, ask any follow-up questions, kind of see where the conversation goes a little bit, but always staying on track um, towards those topics and towards those goals. So in considering uh, possible questions here, we need to be sure that we have some primary and secondary questions planned. We ask a mixture of open and closed questions, some factual, some opinion to kind of see knowledge and their take on knowledge, hypothetical and criti critical incidences, which can be somewhat difficult to answer if you are the interviewee. And we want to really avoid leading questions in an interview. So if we are in the interviewee role, we really want to avoid leading questions. And our text talks about leading questions. And it said some questions look legitimate but have no place in most interviews. Leading questions suggest the answer the interviewee expects. Such as, you're interested in helping us work on this year's United Way campaign, aren't you? Or, you aren't really serious about asking for a raise now, are you? So in those instances, if you have those type of questions, um, think about a way to phrase them differently, either as a direct or indirect question, open or closed. You really want to leave it up to the interviewee to uh, respond in their own manner and kind of get you there that way. So um, again, avoiding leading questions as you plan your questions for the interview. Next, guys, we need to arrange the setting for our interview. So time is really important. What time of the day fits best for the interview? What time meshes with schedules the best? And then we need to think about the place. So we want a distraction-free place, and we want a nice physical arrangement for our interviews. 
So let's think about what time of day here. Uh, first of all, thinking about how you feel at 7, 8 a.m. in the morning, would you want to have an interview that early? Maybe as an interviewee, interviewer, you are a morning person and that works best for you, but always thinking about other people and how the interviewer might interview the best. Um, so I typically would avoid uh, doing interviews bright and early in the morning and kind of set things mid-morning when people's days are starting to roll around a little bit better. Um, also, what time of day you need to consider how much time you might need for the interview. So if this is going to be a very detailed interview, you need to set aside maybe an hour or two hours to do the interview. Maybe it's an all-day process for some specific purpose. And maybe you're only going to need 10 to 15 minutes. And if that's the case, guys, you want to make sure, again, that you have room kind of on the back end and front end of your time frame so that you're not feeling stressed or rushed within the interview. So really giving yourself the adequate time and attention um, to really focus on that interview and that interviewee. Also thinking about schedules, is it best to do it over lunch? Is that too casual? Uh, do you need to schedule something uh, during the workday if the other person can't meet in the workday? What's the best way to do that after hours and still keep things professional? Maybe a casual interview is okay for that kind of setting. So always just juggling those things and thinking about the best way to approach the interview. The place, again, guys, needs to be distraction-free. So maybe a coffee shop might not be the best place. Maybe a restaurant might not be the best place unless it's a very quiet setting. Uh, the physical arrangement, I think, is very interesting in thinking about. If you have a desk or um, a table in between you, that uh, usually creates kind of the hierarchy within the relationship. So the more power, um, if you are separated, if you're right next to each other doing an interview, it's almost more conversation-like um, and less of that power distance between the two people. So what are you going for there in your physical arrangement? Um, what messages are you sending in how you even set up the interview. So very interesting stuff to consider and think about. So here, guys, when we are conducting the interview, again, as the interviewer, the opening of the interview is really, really important. And our text touches on this and um, talking about forming lasting first impressions. And there's a great, great quote in here um, from Dave Deaver. He's a national management recruiter. And he says, the first minute is all important in an interview. 50% of the decision is made within the first 30 to 60 seconds. About 25% of the evaluation is made during the first 15 minutes. It's very difficult to recover for recover the last 25% if you've blown the first couple of minutes. So these initial impressions shape how a listener regards everything that follows. So really in the first 30 to 60 seconds, how you carry yourself um, within the interview, both as the interviewer and as the interviewee, uh, really sets the tone for the interview. So as the interviewer and in opening, you wanna really greet um, and build rapport with your interviewee. So, for instance, if somebody traveled in quite a ways to come to your interview and visit with you that day, maybe you ask about their travels to try and set the mood and uh, lessen anxiety. Maybe you talk about the weather. Maybe it's beautiful outside. Maybe it's pretty cruddy outside, and you talk about that. Uh, maybe you ask if you know them through an acquaintance. Maybe you're talking about that acquaintance. Maybe if you know them on a more personal level, you're opening and greeting, asking about family, friends, that sort of thing. So you're really wanting to build rapport, kind of extend that initial hello, um, again, to lessen any natural anxiety, apprehension that comes with the interview format. We'll talk about orientation here uh, more in depth in our next slide, um, but I also want to touch on motivation for the interview. So as the interviewer, you want to provide um, the audience or the interviewee with a reason to feel like the interview is worthwhile. So for instance, our text says, in some cases you can simply point out the payoffs. If you can figure out a better way to handle these orders, it will save us both time. Or if the interview will not directly benefit the other person, you might appeal to his or her ego or desire to help other people. I'd like to try out a new promotional item and you know more about them than anyone. Another example, if you're going into an employment interview, uh, maybe you're stating that this is a great job and you're really looking to hire someone motivated and ready to go. Okay, so now we'll talk about a little talk a little more in depth about orientation. 
So after we do this greeting and build some rapport, then we need to get into the reason for the interview. All right, so with the reason for the interview, we really want to state the interview's purpose, obviously. So if you're going for an employment interview, as the interviewer, you might be stating uh, what job you're specifically hiring, what position you're specifically hiring. You might state what kind of timeline you're on to make that hiring decision. So really going forward and directly stating the reason for the interview. It might be that the person is going to be getting a promotion and you're going to be talking about some new exciting things in the interview coming up shortly for that person. Maybe there's going to be a lot of changes and maybe downsizing even within the company. So you're talking about layoffs um, and other arrangements or situations that might be coming up um, in terms of that company downsizing. So we always want to be upfront and really kind of our thesis statement, if you will, stating the reason for the interview. All right, so in terms of information needed when we're conducting the opening of the interview, we really want to look back at that overall goal that we had planned and what we need to learn about the topic, situation, person in order to achieve that goal. So our text says a respondent who knows what the interviewer wants will have a greater likelihood of supplying it. So you might want to learn uh, about the person to see if they are qualified for the job. So you might say, I'm going to ask about your work, your experiences, your education, all that good stuff in terms of seeing if you're a good fit for the job. Maybe there's going to be a lot of changes within the company and you want to see how different roles or different workloads, different structure might benefit or be harmful to um, a certain organization or part of a company. So you are asking someone that deals with that uh, section of the company to hear their thoughts. So again, you just want to be really upfront with the information that you are trying to gather um, and that kind of corresponds typically with the reason for the interview. In terms of ground rules, guys, I always think when I call like a help number or a help desk and it says this call may be recorded for security purposes, right? So they're giving you kind of the ground rule, telling you what's to come uh, within your phone call in terms of security and recording. So you want to do the same thing as an interviewer um, for your interviewee. So for example, if you're going to be taking notes during the interview, maybe you just mention that so that they know it's not a negative or that you're not focused on them as the speaker, but that you want to take notes so that you are sure not to forget any details. Maybe you don't want to take notes and you really want to value that face-to-face -face interaction, so you're going to record the session and you just let them know that you have a little recorder there. So just really setting the ground rules uh, for the interview. Length here, uh, we always want to point out how long we think the interview is going to last, and we've typically, typically planned that going in, right? We've set aside a certain amount of time. We want the interviewee to know that length of time. It kind of sets them at ease, and they know what to expect going forward. Uh, for example, I've done a phone interview before. That was kind of the first part in starting the job process. Um, and then I was told that if I got to the next phase, which I'm actually kind of thankful that I didn't in this specific instance, uh, there was the gauntlet is what they called it. And you would fly to um, the base, the headquarters of the company, and then you would interview literally for 10 hours. So each hour you would be with a different person in the company, even going to where you were having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a certain person. And then all of those people were rating you uh, based on how well you did in that interview going forward. So my downfall was saying I wasn't really willing to lo relocate uh, when they asked that question, and that was kind of a sifter question where they were like, eh, this is a deciding factor whether or not you're willing to relocate to Texas, that kind of stuff. But I did know going forward that after my 15, 20 minute phone interview, if I made it to the next step, I would need to really set aside some travel time and prepare for a lot of different interviews and for the longevity of that process, right? So always being again upfront right away in the beginning of our interview about all the logistics to come. All right, so now we'll watch a video with an example of an opening of an interview uh, with the interviewer. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time uh, to interview with us for a position with our firm, and I hope it's a good experience for both of us. Let me just take a few seconds and explain how this will flow. Um, my job if you will, is to learn as much about you as, as I can in a fairly short period of time. That will mean that uh, you'll have to do most of the talking, and hopefully we can guide through that in a way that uh, touches on things that you think are really important. 
uh, while we're talking, I should add that I might make a few notes, and I hope that won't be distracting, but uh, it will help me uh, and the rest of us who discuss candidates later on uh, since we interview so many people in any given day. That's an interview simulation on YouTube, and those are very helpful both as the interviewer and as the interviewee. You can go watch those and see how you might open an interview as the interviewer, and then how you might respond as the interviewee. So great tool in interview preparations on both ends of things. There, let's look at how he opened the interview. So in terms of a greeting and building rapport, I think we needed a little bit more of that and perhaps there was more of that uh, before he actually sat down so in the greeting uh, such as that maybe um, he needed a little bit more in terms of stipulating how long the interview was going to be that could have been sent out possibly in an email before as well but making sure that we're reiterating and covering those things again very well as the interviewer things he did really well uh, talking about the reason for the interview that was very clear the information he was hoping to gather and then clear ground rules in terms of him taking notes and that there would be lots of people um, gathering to talk about about the many candidates. So you gathered a lot of information there um, when he talked very briefly about ground rules. Okay, so now we'll move on to the body of the interview, specifically in regards to the role of the interviewer. So first of all, as the interviewer, you need to maintain control and focus the entire time you are interviewing someone. So this is a lot easier said than done. Uh, first of all, if something is really interesting that somebody says or they share some personal details, you might want to learn a whole lot more about that, but you don't have a lot of time to do so. So you always want to go back to that goal, reason for the interview, those questions that you had planned, and stick to those things and only allocate a certain amount of time for each question. Also, you might find that one is really one aspect of your interview is really interesting or you really want to know more information or you're spending a lot of time following up and asking more questions there. Um, but then you don't get to other questions and other interesting things that you could learn about the person because you are so focused on that one thing. So again, control and focus, really allocating time for each of the questions and each of the topics that you wanted to bring up in the interview and maintaining control to really stay on track with that interview. As the interview is going on, we want to be sure that we are actively listening to the interviewee. So this can be hard, especially when you're new to interviewing and you're very concerned about the time or the situation. Uh, maybe the planning aspect, uh, what question you're going to ask next. So even going back to our speech and thought rate, right? So listening actively, um, your mind is going to be going and thinking about the next question that you want to ask rather than uh, focusing on what the person is saying at that point in time. So try and take a step back, really be in the moment with that person um, and let timing and all of that other stuff be prepared in the planning stages um, of the interview so that when you're in the interview, and actually in the moment, you are there and in the moment. Okay, so then moving on here into um, the role of the interviewer and probing for more information. And our text again gives really great um, examples here of when we might want the person to elaborate. Maybe they're being really vague. Maybe we ask for clarification just to make sure that there's no misunderstanding. Maybe we paraphrase um, to ask the person if what you had interpreted is correct. Maybe you silence to tell them that you are waiting for them to fill the space and offer more information. And then prods here. So I'll give you a couple examples from our text. First of all, um, with repeating a question, um, which is kind of in the paraphrasing realm, I would think. So here with repeating, it says, you said you attended Arizona State for four years. I'm not clear about whether you earned a degree. So it's very important to know if they actually earned a degree from the institution, right? And the respondent said, I completed the required courses in my major as well as several elect electives. And the interviewer said, I see, did you earn a degree? So you're getting more and more specific as you ask those follow-up questions. Another example here similar is with paraphrasing. So a paraphrasing probe restates the answer in a different wording and invites the respondent to clarify and elaborate on a previous uh, answer. So it says, you've been with us for a year. 
and have been promoted once. How do you feel about the direction your career is taking? And they said, I'm satisfied for now. So that kind of leaves a little bit, little bit of an opening for you to ask another question. So far, so good. Is that how you feel? And the respondent said, not exactly. I'm happy to get the promotion, of course, but I don't see many chances for advancement from here. So in asking that clarifying question and paraphrasing their response, you open the doors to ask a lot more questions and get a lot more information there. So again, really going over um, these examples in your text, I think they'll help to clarify the differences there. But always being sure that you're not afraid to ask follow-up questions, especially if someone's being vague or you sense that they have more to say that they just didn't share initially. Next, we'll talk about giving clear, detailed answers to questions asked. So oftentimes, and it's really good, again, as the interviewee, to ask questions of, you, of your interviewer. But as the interviewer, you need to be ready to answer those questions and give clear, detailed answers in response. So common questions are, what is the culture like in uh, this company? What uh, can I expect on as day-to-day -day interaction? What can I expect on my day-to-day -day schedule? Those kinds of things for employment interviews. Um, Follow-up questions might be a timeline for some changes implemented, specifics about what comes with a promotion, those kinds of things. And we need to be prepared on the front end to answer and anticipate those kinds of questions and also take the time to give those detailed responses uh, for those interviewees. We want to correct any misunderstandings, so you might kind of feel that something was misinterpreted, so you go back over that once again. Uh, maybe they have questions and uh, they took something away that you hadn't intended, so you go back and correct that as well. Um, and then in conducting the interview, you also want to be sure that you have covered every, every question that you had planned to ask, every topic that you had planned to ask, um, and that hopefully if you have maintained your time schedule in doing so. Again, going back here um, to control and focus in the interview, uh, covering our agenda is very important in the body of the interview. Then in closing, we need to review and clarify results of the interview. We need to establish future actions. So if it's an employment interview, you might say uh, somebody from the company will be calling you within the next week or so um, in regards to how the interview turned out or future steps, future interviews and that kind of thing. You also want to include with pleasantries, which is a handshake, a thank you for coming in, I really appreciate your time, uh, those kinds of statements there. So now we're going to look into the various types of interviews that we might encounter both as an interviewer and as an interviewee. The first two here will likely be you as an interviewer and your um, status as a student here now. So information gathering and career research is what we'll talk about first. And then employment largely in terms of um, being the interviewee. So first of all, we'll talk about information gathering interviews and our approach to these. So we want to view these as um, gathering information um, and knowing that that is a process. So in terms of getting what we want out of this information gathering interview, we need to be sure again to define interview goals and kind of set a list of questions in our minds before we go into the interview. Um, we also want to go back to thinking, is this going to be a structured interview? Is this going to be a more open and conversational interview? How are things going to work? What's our setup? We also want to choose the right interviewee, so thinking about knowledge, attitudes, all those things that we talked about at the very beginning of our lecture. So here, like a reporter, you're going forward, seeking information, um, seeking and gathering and new facts, stories, statistics, personal, personal references, all those good things. Um, there's lots of different types of information gathering interviews. We can do an investigation, such as maybe you're a CIA agent. I mean, that's the first thing that usually pops to mind, right? We are looking for the facts related to a certain problem. Um, a survey, so you might be just gathering, again, those demographic information, that demographic information, attitudes about something, and thinking about, like, the census or other surveys that you've taken um, what kind of information were they gathering there? Diagnostic surveys, so this is like going to the doctor when they ask you all these questions and you have to describe your symptoms for why you're at the doctor, that kind of thing. 
Um, for research purposes, you might be doing an information gathering interview. Uh, for instance, I did a qualitative study in my thesis in school on um, emojis and how couples used emojis in their own relationships. So I had some questions that I asked each set of couples, um, and then I also did some, some follow-up questions there based on uh, based on what I found in those larger questions. So more of a semi-structured interview there, uh, but for research purposes. So that was an information gathering interview. Another common information gathering interview is an exit interview. And this is where you're asking people that are leaving your company or leaving your organization and wanting to know why they are doing so. Um, so you have that information moving forward and maybe you can fix some problems or things that might not be quite right in the company um, so that others don't follow suit in, in their uh, quitting or leaving the company as well. Another type of interview that you might need to conduct as an interviewer is a career research interview, and we'll actually do one of these in our class. So our text defines a career research interview as a special type of informational interview in which you meet with someone who can provide information that will help you define and achieve your career goals. It is based on the principle that speaking with the right people can give you valuable ideas and contacts you simply cannot find from books, magazines, the internet, or any other source. So these are the things, again, that you cannot find elsewhere. It's very unique to the person, very unique to the situation, very unique to that career field. Um, so the value of personal contacts you can see is super, super important. They help us conduct research, they help us be remembered in the field, and they help us gain referrals. So in talking about the value of networking here, our text touches on a phrase that I actually use often. It says, it isn't what you know, it's who you know. And guys, that is very, very true in the career field, sometimes unfortunately true. Um, but we really want to, because that is such a heavy influence in who gets jobs and who gets jobs where, uh, we need to make sure that we are making these valuable contacts and that we are remembered. Um, even if you don't get a job uh, right away, you want to be remembered if something else comes up down the road where they're calling you up and saying, you know, I interviewed you six months ago and you didn't quite fit with that specific job, but I think I have one that's really great for you now. So career research interviews, even if you don't get a job and you are in an employment interview, these can be kind of couple over and be a career research interview where you are just making those connections um, and learning about the career field, being remembered, gaining referrals in the future. Now when you are conducting this typical career research interview, you want to be sure that you again are choosing the correct person to interview. So uh, for example, when I did this class, I was interested in becoming a lawyer. So I uh, contacted a local lawyer that I'd met very briefly a couple times. I'm from Cody and he's from Cody. And I called him up and asked if I could do an interview the next time I was home. And I went home and I remember asking him, if you could go back to school, would you be a lawyer again? And he said, absolutely not. And then he went on to tell me why he would not be a lawyer. And uh, for some people, I think a lawyer is a really great fit and he's an awesome lawyer. Uh, but it really kind of hit home with me that he would not go and do that career again. And he provided several personal examples as to why not. Um, and I remember thinking, gosh, maybe I maybe I shouldn't become a lawyer. And here I am as a professor and went and got my master's in communication instead of going to law school. So these career research interviews can be super, super helpful and super, super imperative in deciding kind of the road that you choose to take. And who you choose to interview has a huge uh, impact on that. So being very cautious. Are you choosing the right person? Are you choosing someone that's credible in the field? Are you choosing someone that has the lifestyle that you want? Um, all those considerations need to come into play. Before the interview, you need to make sure that you're contacting the prospective interviewee um, and that you're giving them uh, enough time to kind of prepare for the interview, set aside their own time, um, and knowing what you want from that interview. Uh, then we need to actually follow up and do the interview um, and make sure that we are acting professional, that we are prepared for the interview, have those questions set out. Again, going back to those preparation tools. Then guys, I really wanna to touch up 
touch on following up here. Um, and our text says, after the meeting, take the time to write a letter, email, or handwritten card to express appreciation for the interviewee's time and mention how helpful the information was. So besides demonstrating common courtesy, your message becomes a tangible reminder of you. So again, we want to be remembered and provides a record of your name and address that will be useful if the interviewee wants to contact you in the future. Of course, all correspondence should be composed with impeccable format, spelling, and grammar. And guys, we think this is really essential with a career research interview because you are taking their time um, and you want to be sure that you recognize that and you're sending them a thank you and following up on what you've learned and all that good stuff. But I do think that following up on any type of interview is great um, if you're sending just a quick note to say that you appreciate your their time um, following up or clarifying anything um, that you might have run into in the interview. Um, all that stuff is just great to show that you, again, appreciate their time and that you took something out of the interview, uh, that you see merits in the interview. Okay. So now, guys, we're going to move into the employment interview, and here we're going to shift to how uh, we would approach an employment interview as the interviewee. All right, so employment interviews, I think this is what uh, is most interesting about this lecture um, and for this class and moving into uh, the job market. So employment interviews, we have to do some pre-interview steps. So the first thing, and I think a really, really important thing, is cleaning up our online identity. So this goes really heavily with um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anything that the public has access to or can search for um, by name. So being sure that you have your settings locked down pretty tight and that you are conscious of what you are sharing on social media. There's, an ex there's examples with athletes and public figures where people have gone back through their Twitter or Instagram and found comments or tweets, uh, Facebook posts that are harmful to their current image um, or that tie back to a time period like five, ten years back where what they said they would never say now. Uh, so we want to really be sure that we have cleaned all that up and that it's ready for the professional world and any eyes that might see it outside of our network. So remembering that what is online even when it's locked, um, might have already been out there somewhere else on the World Wide Web. Um, and we just need to be conscious of that and do our best to present um, the most professional image in our online um, accounts. Then we need to conduct some background research on uh, the company or person that we might be interviewing with. Um, so if you are interviewing with the CEO, maybe you can do some background information on him or her themselves so that you have some elements of common ground that you can bring to the table. Another thing I want to point out here um, with employment interviews is it's really important to do background research on the company itself. And this goes into looking into their core values, their mission statement, projects that they're working on, their history, who's in charge. I mean, you want to have a pretty broad overview and then some details that you can bring up and maybe even start to plan and incorporate in your own answers and how you could be value added to that company. So as you're doing that research, you might be thinking, hey, I fit well with this asset aspect of the company, hey, this is something that I can bring up that I want to work on so that I can fit within the company. Um, background research is very important, and I would say it's something that we need to do pretty well in advance. This shouldn't be something that you're kind of just skimming through their website and hoping to find a few tidbits to share in the interview. It should be pretty comprehensive uh, research that you've spent some time on. Then we want to contact potential employers, and this is with a cover letter and resume that we have been talking about. So uh, you want to kind of show who you are on paper and present yourself in the best way possible there, as we've talked about. And then when you get that foot in the door, when you get to into the starting gates of the race, right, we want to have the skills to present ourselves well in the interview. And this starts again with cleaning up who we are online and conducting some background research on the company and doing that front end work to make our cover letter and resume the best possible. 
We also need to prepare for different formats. So likely the interviewer will have told you ahead of time what kind of interview you're going into, but sometimes they won't, and you just need to be prepared for any of them. So a panel interview is where you might have three, four, or five, any number of people sitting in on the interview. And this saves time for people because um, they're able to not need they are they don't have to relay the information to other people in the company and you don't have to interview with several people in the company you're kind of just with everybody at one time so that's helpful it's like a team or group interview there you might have a stress interview uh, this is to evaluate your behavior under press pressure researching this type of interview and being prepared for such poise will help you remain um, calm and in control uh, the other type of interview you might encounter is an audition interview, and this is where you'll be asked to demonstrate your skills to an employer. Um, so for example, I help with design at the newspaper that I work for, and I had to show them that I could use um, Adobe software, and that I could edit a photo, and that I could um, design elements on a page in InDesign. Um, another thing might be, um, can you use statistical programs or engineering programs if you're doing that kind of job? So stress interviews, handling difficult situations. They might put you in difficult situations. Audition interview, really testing your skills. So both emotion and your skill set, right? Then we have a behavioral interview, which um, kind of ties to a stress interview, but more how you've handled things um, in past experiences. So I think even in just a normal introductory interview, they'll ask you some behavioral questions such as, can you tell me about a time where you have uh, been posed with a challenge at work and how you handled it? And here, guys, you want to kind of have something prepared where you've worked through difficult situations or handled difficult people, and you want to provide kind of a detailed story there. So starting, beginning, middle, end. Uh, be concise, not rambling, but really telling all of the specifics and how you handled things, both in your behavior and then what you said verbally. So verbally and non-verbally, how you handled situations in your behavioral type of interviews and questions. Our next bullet point here is we really want to think constructively as we are preparing for our interviews. So I'll go back to preparing for public speaking as well. Uh, we always want to cognitively restructure our thoughts. So if you have negative thoughts like, I don't know why I'm doing this or I'm not going to be good at this, uh, we want to think about how we can kind of flip that around and think about it from a more positive viewpoint. Uh, such as this will be good for me, this is a really great learning experience, um, I can do this, even something as simple as that. So we want to think constructively. And our text talks about a study done where um, study they studied uh, very anxious people uh, with high anxiety and so the effects of their negative self-talk um, versus people that maybe still had a little bit of anxiety but approached the interview situation more positively um, and the impacts that that had. So again, always thinking constructively as we prepare and go into interview settings. We also want to dress and act appropriately. So look good, feel good, right? We want to go into any situation knowing what's expected, thinking about that company culture. Um, going in for a construction type of job might be a little bit different than going into a corporate uh, corporate setting, right? So uh, maybe you dress up just a little bit from what you would wear on the job in a construction setting and you're wearing like a polo and slacks or a polo and really nice jeans, nice dark jeans. Uh, maybe you're going into a corporate setting and you go for the suit and tie in that kind of situation. Um, girls, we always want to be conservative and dress just again a little bit above what we think might be expected there. Um, pulling our hair back often shows uh, more professionalism, not wearing a whole lot of jewelry, just simple, professional, um, prepared. Uh, acting appropriately is also very important, obviously, as we go into um, interviews. It says 79% of recruiters state that their initial impression influences the rest of the interview. So how you carry yourself and how you dress is super, super important. Uh, we also want to be sure to arrive to an interview five to ten minutes early, and we want to bring extra copies of our resume. Again, with that quality paper, we want to have a notepad and pen just in case we need to take any notes. We never want to be asking for supplies during an interview. You might bring a portfolio if you think that that will help you explain your skills. Some people will even ask for a portfolio, but I think if you show up to an interview where a portfolio is not expected and you have a very professional presentation ready,
ready to share, not necessarily a PowerPoint, but just some examples of your work, that might really set you apart in um, interview settings. Uh, you also want to avoid limp handshakes. You want to keep your handshakes no more than three shakes, so just brief, um, nice, st strong handshake. You want to smile. You want to make eye contact with your interviewee, um, and you want to take the lead from your interviewer on how to proceed. So this can be stuff like you enter the room after you've been invited in, you sit down after you've been invited to sit down, all that good stuff. Okay, so during the interview, we want to anticipate key questions, and we've likely looked through, and our book has a lot of examples of these questions um, and prepared some examples, but we want to anticipate questions about our educational background, our work experience, our overall career goals, personal traits that might relate to our career and our work experience, knowledge of the organization and job. And again, that goes back to our research. You might have even printed off the job uh, description once again so that you can reference that during the job interview, um, all that good stuff. So getting a little bit more into our text, I want you to really, really, again, I'm going to emphasize this, rely on your text. There's some commonly asked questions most frequent interview mistakes such as lying, answering your cell phone, or texting during an interview. Don't do that. Um, appearing arrogant or entitled, and I think that's a balance, guys, between, um, I always find this with the question, why should we hire you? Uh, that's a balance between being, seeming like you're bragging about yourself um, and being super arrogant. So uh, you wanna practice those um, responses to those questions and how you might approach uh, questions like that. Again, anticipating those key questions. Uh, why should we hire you here is in our text, and it says do not give a generic answer. Nearly everyone says that they are hardworking and motivated. Briefly list your unique strengths and qualifications showing how they will help you perform the job in question. So just a couple examples there. Again, going back to your book, looking at everything they have to offer you, I think this will really help you in anticipating and answering key questions. During the interview, guys, we want to make sure that the employer's needs and concerns are at the top of our mind. So the employers aren't necessarily interested in hiring you how the job will help you. They're really interested in how you will help them and fit into the company. So you want to be sure, again, to respond to the employer's needs and concerns. So uh, employers have three main concerns. Are you qualified to do the job? Are you motivated to, to do the job? And will you fit with the organization's culture and get along with your colleagues? So in response to those questions, you need to be very descriptive, elaborate more than you think you actually should a lot of the time. And you wanna always be sure that you're being honest and as upfront as possible in your answers. So for instance, our book says, the interviewer might ask, what was your major in college? And this is going to be on your resume, guys, what your major in college was. So if you just say, I was a communication major, you are not providing any additional information than what your resume told them. So you might say something instead like, I was a communication major. I'm glad I studied that subject because the skills I learned in school could help me in this job in so many ways. Dealing with customers from many cultures, working in the department working in the department teams, and creating presentations for the external contractors who are part of the job. And you might even go on from there. So taking something that they likely already knew, they're asking you this question because they really want you to expand. So anticipate that, be honest, be forthcoming with your answers. Um, another thing, guys, we want to emphasize the positive. So although you should always be honest, it is wise to phrase your answers in a way that casts you in the most positive light. So here's another example. I noticed you've held several jobs, but you haven't had any experience in the field you've applied for. So as new college grads, this is going to be a question that you're almost always asked because you might not have specific experience in the field that your degree is in. And likely experience is going to kind of trump your education to start. Your education is a great foot in the door, but then you have to be able to explain this negative and turn it into a positive again for the company, how your inexperience almost is going to benefit the company. Company, right? So a negative answer might be, uh, that's right. I've decided I wanted to go in this to this field and only let me see, let me start that over. Uh, that's right. I decided I wanted to go into this field only last year. I wish I had known that earlier. 
So a more positive answer in response to their, I've noticed you've held several jobs, but you haven't had any experience in the field you have applied for, would be, that's right, I've worked in a number of fields and I've been successful in learning each one quickly. I'd like to think this kind of adaptability will help me learn this job and grow with it as technology changes the way the company does business. So we always want to, again, emphasize the positives, kind of turn the question around how you will help the company use positive attributes and avoid criticizing others. So we never want to put the fault, our fault, on the shoulders of somebody else. We just kind of want to own up to it and turn it around again and show how um, those experiences have shaped where we are today and what we have to offer in the future. We want to back up our answers with evidence. So we talked about this a little bit, uh, but here's some more details. So we want to talk about the problem, so giving the beginning, the action, what we actually did to solve the problem, and the result. You want to keep your answers brief, but finding that balance between being too brief and not sharing enough to rambling, right? So you want to share, um, and if you think about what was the problem, what did I do, and what was the result, that should help you stay on track and offer just enough information. Also, during the interview, you want to be enthusiastic, be happy to be there, motivated to do the job. You want to make sure that you have your questions answered. So I would say you always want to ask a question. And typically, one of the last questions that the interviewee, interviewer will ask you is, do you have any questions for us? And rarely should you say, I don't have any questions. I think we've covered everything. Unless you've been in a pretty detailed and collaborative interview throughout um, at the end, you should always have some form of a question, whether it's can you describe, again, the day-to-day -day experience here? Can you describe the company culture? Um, can you tell me some really cool projects that are up and coming that you're about to introduce? Um, ask something to really open up that conversation and that dialogue. You want to rehearse your interview. So again, going back, looking over those questions, thinking about how you might answer those questions, even reviewing how you might phrase things. So again, just like you would practice for a speech, you're going to practice for an interview and have your thoughts in order as you go into that interview. Following the interview, we want to write a thank you letter. This dish demonstrates courtesy, reminds the employer of you, provides facts, a reminder of promises discussed in the interview, and again, to correct misunderstandings. You can see how all of these things start to flow and become commonplace in various aspects of the employment process. And post-interview follow-up is super, super important and a step that I think is often forgotten. Um, so be sure that you are the one that always sends and takes the time to write a post-interview interview follow-up in a very professional, organized, structured, um, correct manner, right? Checking spellings, grammar, all that stuff. All right, now we will shift into our last section here, a much, much more brief section in this lecture, um, interviewing and the law. For this interviewing in the law section, we're largely going to focus on it from, from the perspective of the interviewee. So first of all, it's important to understand what BFOQ means, and it is bona fide occupational qualification. This means any question asked in an interview should be job related. The interviewer cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, disabilities, national origin, or age. Disabilities is covered more uh, extensively in our text talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and this says uh, that reasonable accommodations must be made for people with a disability um, and it goes on to say the law clearly states however that disabled candidates can be questioned only about their ability to perform essential functions of a job and that employers are obligated to provide accommodations for disabled candidates and employees. So uh, you can see there where the boundary kind of crosses between what is legal and what is not legal in terms of figuring out if the person can do the job, physically do the job with the disability. So now we'll talk about responding to illegal questions if these questions are not job related. So one way you could respond to this e these illegal questions is to answer without any obligate without any objection so answering the question knowing that it is probably unlawful and here you kind of have to judge uh, for yourself 
whether or not you're going to give the interviewer the benefit of the doubt. So our text says that a study reported in the Wall Street Journal reveal, revealed that more than 70% of the 200 interviewers in Fortune 500 companies thought at least 5 of 12 unlawful questions were safe to ask. So some interviewers really don't know that what they're asking you is illegal or shouldn't be asked in the interview setting. Um, they may simply be trying to make conversation with you, um, and you have to be the judge of that. Are you going to answer without objection? Was it a serious question that you feel very uncomfortable answering, answering, or is it something that you're just willing to share and kind of gloss over? So that's a judgment call again there, but you could respond by answering without any objection. You could seek explanation for the for the question, so the ask the interviewer firmly and respectfully to explain why this question um, is being asked. So I'm having a hard time seeing how my age relates to my ability to do this job. Can you explain? And there your interviewer, if they don't know, will likely backtrack and think, oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't have asked that, apologize, move on, or just ask you a new question, right? So you can seek explanation. That might be a great way um, to go about dealing with the situation and uh, being posed with an legal question. Redirection is also a very effective um, mode to responding. Um, if an interviewer asks how old are you, you might shift the focus toward the position requirements and say, what you've said so far suggests age isn't as important as willingness to travel. That isn't a problem for me. So you're just redirecting to another aspect of the job and showing that you've done that research, that you've really been paying attention, um, and kind of indirectly saying that age shouldn't be asked. It's not a factor, right? Refusal to answer, guys, this is where I would say you're offended and you really just are not interested in beating around the bush and you're just straight up not going to answer the question. So you'd say, I'd rather not talk about religion. That's a personal matter for me. So you're not being rude. You're explaining why you don't want to talk about it um, and trying to move on with the interview. Lastly, guys, it's really important to remember that being interviewed does not mean you are at the interviewer's mercy. You do have rights. There are laws in place um, in how interviewing should be conducted. We need to be conscious of them as an interviewer and know our rights as an interviewee. So after this whole chapter, I hope we feel more confident in how we prepare to approach an interview, both as an interviewer and an interviewee. And we can go forth with our assignments in this class and out outside in the real world and landing our dream jobs, hopefully. So if you have any questions, again, always email me, pop into office hours. I'm happy to help in your job searches and writing your resumes and cover letters. Just let me know. Thanks.